what's emerging in China right now is is just an unprecedented form of techno authoritarianism underpinned by AI. The Chinese government is building an unparalleled centralized system of control over 1.2 billion people underpinned by facial recognition. Here's one tiny example. What's going on, guys? Welcome to AI Firehose. I'm Ash Bennington. Great panel of guests today. Today, I'm joined, as always, by Mikhail Voloshin and also David Matten. David, welcome. Hi there, Ash. Hi there, Mikhail. How are you? Always a pleasure to be here. Doing great, man. Listen, I should say we had a Twitter Spaces conversation a couple of weeks ago that was just absolutely outstanding. I was just blown away by the insight uh, and the observations that you guys brought together, interacting, talking about technology in general and AI specifically. So I'm thrilled to have both of you back here for this conversation. Let's just jump right in. Mikhail, it's been a couple of weeks since we've done this. What's going on in the AI space? Uh, there's been a flurry of activity. Um, you know, this, there's plenty of stuff coming out every single week, and uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we talked. So it's kind of hard to narrow down a, a subject uh, to specifically focus on. But uh, I think that what we're going to be talking about this week is face recognition, uh, which is a different class of technology, uh, or at least a different use case of technology than what we've been talking about, which is generative models, uh, primarily LLMs. Um, in particular, uh, there was a, a feature story a little earlier this month about, or I guess last month, uh, in the New York Times about a company called Clearview AI. Uh, they are uh, they have some pioneering software that scans uh, just general pictures that are out there, photographs, and claim to be able to identify uh, any face in any photo. Uh, the performance of the software is pretty impressive. They're not the only company that's doing this, but the reason that they're kind of a big deal is because they are prominently integrated with law enforcement. Turns out there's a lot of police agencies out there that are using uh, face recognition technology to try and find perpetrators, uh, sometimes find witnesses, and uh, Clearview isn't the only one uh, that produces this software, but it's been the most vocal about uh, how it's used and uh, just sheer numbers and, um, you know, just like the it, it claims of capability. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount to talk about here. This particular feature seems to just scare the hell out of people in general uh, for a whole variety of reasons that we're going to get into in just a minute. Uh, David, thoughts on this big picture, facial recognition, AI and law enforcement? Yeah, it's a huge one. And and I've been following the story of Clearview for years through my newsletter. And it is an absolutely fascinating story. I mean, just as Mikhail said, this is a company that essentially has gone to the internet and just scraped every single human face it can find from, from, from the net, you know, billions of faces from social media profiles and so on, and just built this huge database of humanity um, right. And then it stepped out to clients and the and the the core clients it's found have been law enforcement departments in the United States. Uh, and there's been all kind, you know, and, and civil rights organizations in the US have essentially been at war with Clearview about about this, you know, that uh, that this is this is a this is a breach of privacy and a kind of uh, appropriation of data on a scale the like of which we've never seen before. You know, the privacy implications, the human rights impl implications are huge. Some US police departments have really, you know, are really using Clearview services pretty heavily. I think in other states, they've said, look, we're not gonna use it. The EU uh, is taking quite a different position, I think. And don't quote me on this, but they, I mean, there's certainly been conversations around, around it being banned. Um, this is a huge rolling story. It's not going to go away. And it poses huge questions to us when it comes to our response. Because just as the idea of a, a, a private organization ripping through the internet, you know, scraping billions of faces, building a database, and then selling that back to our governments, just as that idea is incredibly scary. Um, there's no denying some of the real potent benefits it's going to deliver. It's going to make it easier to catch bad guys. 
you know, that there's there's all kinds of legitimate questions about what it's going to do that's wrong. It's going to do some great stuff as well. And when you push it to the logical extension, I mean, when I write about Clearview, I so often also end up mentioning what is happening in China right now. What's emerging in China right now is is just an unprecedented form of techno authoritarianism underpinned by AI. And a, and a big part board. of the way it's underpinned by AI is, is that it's underpinned by facial recognition. The Chinese government is building an unparalleled centralized system of control over 1.2 billion people underpinned by facial recognition. Here's one tiny example. If you're playing video games in China, there are now, and you're, you're a teenager, there are now laws that have been enacted that the video game companies have to use facial recognition technology to shut the video game off after like one hours, two hours. If you have young children, then you know how difficult it is to get them off video games sometimes and the war you wage with them over screen time. In China, central government has solved that problem with facial recognition. It's done it in a way that we would view as a, an extreme breach of privacy rights, but at the same time, it's solved a huge problem. So we're going to face this ethical conundrum. Do we want to buy into the, the enormous benefits here, or do we want to remain true to a set of norms and sort of institutional norms and rights and laws that we've built up over centuries? And Clearview is just is where that ethical conundrum is really kind of where that rubber is really meeting the road. And that's what makes it such a fascinating company at the moment. You know, Clearview's innovation isn't necessarily technical. Uh, in fact, uh, the, I believe that the Times article specifically says that its innovation is ethical. Uh, the Times article claims that this technology was uh, forbidden by previous large stakeholders such as Google or Facebook. The idea is that these guys already had uh, tech, face rec technology of uh, equivalent power way back in 2011, but they decided to not release it to the public because it was too powerful. I, I, I've got opinions about that, but the, um, but the bottom line is that uh, Clearview is innovating specifically because instead of withholding this technology, they specifically said, yeah, let's do it and let's put it out there. And their CEO, Hoan, Hoan Ton thought, I'm, I'm so sorry for what I'm doing to that name, <clears throat> but um, he specifically said that uh, upon building this thing, he wanted to release it in a pro-social manner that benefits the world in some way. And the avenue that he chose to pursue is by uh, releasing it in a way that benefits law enforcement. So whether or not that is pro-social, or literally the exact opposite thereof is, uh, is, is kind of what we're talking about. Um, now, you're absolutely right about, uh, about what's going on in China. And in fact, uh, as a, like, I didn't know that about video games. I would be so arrested in China for so many reasons, but that's just one more. That, that, that's good to know. Um, there's a, a slightly more amusing uh, anecdote that I have from China that uh, that dates back to 2018, where a woman was arrested for jaywalking because a traffic cam picked her up uh, in the middle of the street. Uh, the woman's name was Dong Mingzhu. Again, sorry what I'm doing about it to that name. And uh, she has a very large air conditioning business. And it turned out that she advertises on the sides of buses. And what the traffic cam picked up was her face in an ad on the side of a bus. And for that, she got a citation. She was able to, able to plead that down, but there's, uh, you know, that, that's just a great ex example of the way that this technology can be used where the, it, it gives too much confidence to law enforcement agencies that they've, you know, got their guy when in actuality uh, we're dealing with false positives and other glitches that, uh, that, that just seem, in this case, silly, but in other cases could be pretty horrifying. Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's Raoul here from Real Vision. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, get the notifications. We have so many incredible conversations with so many amazing people. It will really help you in your financial journey and your journey to understand just what the hell's going on in this world. Anyway, click subscribe, get the notifications and enjoy. 
You know, it's interesting when we talk about this case about sort of scraping the web for vast amounts of information. I feel like we all have that one buddy from high school who refuses to get a Facebook account because he's totally paranoid uh, about the fact that it's going to somehow be scraped. And and now here we are. Here's your example. Here's your use case. Uh, our friend, uh, our paranoid friend from high school seems to be right in terms of the ability of large, uh, you know, databases to be gathered based on social media data. Well, not having a Facebook account is not going to save you from having your photo on the internet. Uh, right. There was a BBC report where they uh, there was a reporter who interviewed uh, the Clearview uh, CEO, whose name I will not try to pronounce again, and uh, he tried to see. Uh, he did a search. The, the reporter did a search for himself, and sure, he got all of his like LinkedIn pics and all of his Facebook pics and stuff like that. But he also got pictures of himself in the background of like concerts and music festivals and just on the street uh, from like people whom he doesn't know who were happening to take a selfie while he coincidentally was in the background in that exact moment. And there he is. He's like, wow, that's me. I'm, you know, I'm in this photo. I, you know, had no idea. Um, you know, it reminds me of this one scene from Parks and Rec uh, where Ron Swanson uh, Googles his own uh, home address and immediately throws his computer into the trash. And for me, what was funny about that was like throwing your computer into the trash is not going to get your house off of Google. Right. Yeah, David, go ahead. Jump in. I see you're not. I mean, yeah, it's it, it, it's a it's a fascinating place we're in. And um I can't help but be discomforted by the idea of a private organization, a startup, essentially just ripping through the Internet, scraping billions of faces, compiling a database and selling that selling that to 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 government organizations. You know, um, we have huge conversations about what government can and can't and should and shouldn't be able to to do and to do to us. And, you know, nowhere are those conversations more energetic than in the United States. And that is in many ways a wonderful thing. There at least needs to be, in my view, I think a conversation, a big shared public conversation about whether this should happen or not. And, um, you know, in the end, I think this, this sort of uh, taps into bigger positions I take on sort of AI for the people, essentially. I think, I think we need to, to, to move to a place where we as a collective kind of come together and do some of this together in ways that ensure it benefits all of us you know uh, and that's that's partly why i'm so interested in in um in stability ai and stable diffusion and the, and the open source attitude they're taking to to large language models and their sort of fundamental mission which is about empowering everyone with ai and allowing people to to build and fine tune AI models according to their own values and their own beliefs and their, their own worldview. You know, I think that that sort of AI for the people movement is really powerful. I think it can be a part of a of a of a better future, or it can it can lead us to the version of the future that I think most of us want. Um, and perhaps something similar can happen when it comes to you know billion strong, multi billion strong databases of of human faces. There, there's there's something analogous about the way they've built it i mean with large language models essentially you've gone to you've you've gone to the the net you've scraped billions and billions of words you've done statistic statistics <laughs> and you've built this model um they've gone to the net scraped billions of faces and built this this database it, it, we, we're talking about private organizations raiding the commons like raiding what is held collectively yeah. and what belongs to all of us and look, look, mixing that with their labor, doing work on it, um, and then selling that product back to us. We need to be, and you know, incredible innovations, incredible creativity is at work. I don't, I don't want to downplay the achievements of these organizations, um, some of them. Um, but so me, we need to be very careful about how we let that happen and where it's leading us. Let, let me well, just jump in real quick here. I want to ask this question of you, Mikhail. You know, we're talking about the public policy implications. We're talking about some of the, the philosophical aspects of this. Let's zoom the camera out a little bit for people who are just trying to get their heads around the current state of play with this technology. Talk a little bit, Mikhail, about where we are in the state of facial recognition. How good is this technology? How pervasive is this technology? What's the current state of play uh, as we find ourselves here at the end of 2023? Yeah. Oh man, that's a uh, that's a question. Um, 
So the uh, so first and foremost, uh, face recognition technology works uh, is still is still generally done with neural networks, but it's done with a slightly different wiring pattern of neural networks than a lot of these language models. Uh, nowadays, most uh, uh, most facial recognition technology is done with an image recognition system called a convolution neural network, um, whose wiring patterns are designed to be reminiscent of certain ways that the brain is wired in the visual cortex. And the, um, the results have started to get really good uh, since about 20, I want to say 2017 or so. Uh, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, the uh, there are some underlying technical factors uh, that have allowed for deep neural networks to be a lot more uh, trainable nowadays than they used to be. Now, it, when it comes in terms of how good they are, like it's a great question because this uh, a lot of the articles that you read on this topic will give you a lot of hype, and I will tell you that at scale, a lot of that hype is unwarranted. And so here's what I mean. Um, the uh, so Clearview itself uh, boasts a very very high uh, recognition rate. Uh, they claim 100% re nearly 100% recognition, but that's only on mugshots. In other words, if you have two mugshots of the same person, they claim that you're able to identify that same person. In you know that the, the AI can identify that it's the same person. That is a very very far cry from having some random photo of you know by some random camera with random lens properties, uh, and then have a completely different photo of that same person uh, at a different time of day with different facial hair. And uh, you know, or different styles, uh, wearing different glasses, and so on, and then say that that's still the same. Uh, the reason that, in in my opinion, the reason that this technology was taken off the board uh, by giants such as Facebook and Google is precisely because they had giant data sets to work with and had a lot to lose, whereas uh, this you know, whereas this startup Clearview AI did not. <clears throat> uh, before uh, so. To illustrate what uh, usually goes wrong with this, uh, do normal people uh, do know about this thing called the birthday paradox? It's a mathematical phenomenon that comes up a lot in statistics. I think it's I think it's fair to assume that most people probably do not remember birthday paradox uh, from their uh, high school uh, statistics class. So the gist is like if you have a if you have random people in a room. Uh, what's the probability that any two of those people happen to have the same birthday? Uh, and there's 365 days in a year, so people usually think that that number has to be very high. But uh, in order to reach a 50% level requires a shockingly low number of people. Um, in order, uh, something like, uh, if memory serves, like 23 people, something like that. Uh, if you have 23 people in a room, and I'll need to Google this later, uh, then there's a 50% chance that two of them happen to already have the same birthday. And uh, just as background, the reason that that's the case is that uh, every single time you introduce a new person into the room, uh, you are performing a number of comparisons that is equal to the number of people that are already in that room. It's an N squared scaling, blah, blah, blah. blah. Anyway. The point is, um, the uh, the probability of two people having faces that happen to look the same within the tolerances of the software and of the resolutions of the cameras uh, of the pictures that are being compared gets much, much higher the more people you have uh, in your database. Right. Yeah, and the so, difference is uh, between sort of physiognomy, facial structure, and birthdays is that they change over time. So when you talk about this idea of tolerance, you have to have some degree. I mean, for example, you know, you change your glasses, you grow a beard, you cut your hair, you gain 20 pounds, you lose 20 pounds. You need to be able to have this variability built into the system. Here's the problem with that. That variability, exactly as you point out, means that you may look more or less like someone else on any given day. And obviously when what we're talking about here is guilt and innocence, the ability of, you know, the police to show up behind your door. I know one of the stories that we're going to talk about today, uh, Mikhail, uh, is about a, a guy who was accused of murder, vehicular homicide, homicide specifically. Uh, but these are extremely, extremely sensitive uh, contact. I know the story is a little bit different. It wasn't him on camera. Uh, but right. we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but obviously, this is of the, the highest priority and the highest sensitivity. 
So, you know, I myself just had an encounter with a failure of visual of uh, face recognition. I uh, I have a fa I have a financial institution that has a mobile app and I was trying to prove my identity on this app in order to unlock some features. Uh, and it makes me take a photo of my driver's license and it, you know, checks the face on the driver's license and then it makes me take a live photo in front of the camera itself. <laughs> right. And the um like i could not get this thing to understand that the photo of me in person is the same photo is the same guy as who's in the driver's license no amount of like angles or like changing of lighting or anything could could get this thing to believe that i'm actually me like i don't know have i like look the way that this uh, technology works under the hood is supposed to be based on physiognomical invariance. It's supposed to be based on things like the spacing between your eyes and the width and the distance from your pupil to the corner of your mouth, uh, that kind of thing. Um, back when we did this back in the 90s, these systems were actually hard coded. There was a really prominent uh, roboticist named Rodney Brooks uh, who ran a very widely acclaimed me uh, 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 lab in MIT that uh, had a sort of 17 point checklist for measurements that would stay invariant. And the um, and that was the gold standard of face recognition at the time. Uh, nowadays, well, go ahead. Well, now, nowadays we just let neural networks figure that out for us. But the uh, but the point still stands. These are supposed to be based on things that don't change over time and yet this thing could not recognize me to save its life so that's a type one error right. a false positive sorry 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 that's a type two error a false negative i am me and it doesn't recognize it uh there's also of course problems with false positives which is where yeah. somebody who isn't me gets recognized as me and that it, like especially when it comes to law enforcement leads to a world of hurt or real quick there was a case in 2018 with I don't think it was Clearview. I think it was a different face recognition system where a man in the Bronx was pinged for uh, for stealing a pair of socks or a six pack of socks, and uh, he was pinged because uh, because of face recognition technology. Um, he was arrested, and uh, for whatever reason, the the cops believed that the charge stuck. Uh, and the reason why he was arrested for it was because he apparently was armed while stealing these socks. So something that would have been a like just a minor shoplifting turns into armed robbery and blah blah blah. Um, the point is, this man was provable. This man's son was born that day, and he was provably on his way to the hospital at the time at which this robbery occurred. So, a lot of people believe that it, that it's. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna take sides on this, but um, you know, I don't want to like. I, I believe that it's very, very, very unlikely that the man who was seen in the, you know, in the shoplift cam uh, was also the man who happened to be on his way to his son's birth and happened to decide to commit armed robbery just going to the hospital. Um, well, let's pull so David into the conversation because obviously there's a lot there. Uh, David, uh, clearly a lot of technical questions, a lot of ethical questions, a lot of questions about the nature structure of society, how we negotiate these changes with ourselves. Uh, many points. I saw you smiling and nodding. Thoughts. Yeah, I mean, the first first off the bat, you know, listening to these stories, of course, makes you think we can't accept these forms of facial recognition technologies yet as as evidence in in you know in the way that we accept many other things as evidence. You know, they're they're not reliable enough yet. They're they're not kind of secure enough yet to really to really work in that way. Um, we can continue to develop them. They'll continue to get better. What we're going to hit up against then are different questions, and they will be questions about about trade offs. Uh, uh, and that was, and that's really what I'm driving at too with this comparison with China. You know, there, there's a there's a there's a there's an incredible and profoundly different technology fueled social system emerging across the seas in China that is going to be potent in all kinds of new and incredible ways. What you, what you incur for that potency is you trade off things like privacy and freedoms and you know, kind of individual freedom against centralized control and centralized government. 
And, and we in the global north are going to have to have a collective conversation about the extent to which we are happy to, to make those trade-offs. And it's going to be very difficult. And these technologies are in all kinds of ways going to be extremely seductive. If you tell millions of parents, like Mikhail, you'd be fine in China on the video games because this only applies to children. Like, But if you tell millions of parents, we've got this tech-fueled way that will just squash your arguments about screen time and video game time instantly, many instinctively will embrace that. It will appeal to them. But there's a trade-off going on underneath, and it's a trade-off around privacy and individual liberty. We've already demonstrated that almost everyone in the global north is willing to walk down that road and make significant trade-offs for you know convenience and uh, and the kind of superpowers that online life kind of allow you. You know, we've given our data and we've given so much of ourselves to big technology platforms and big companies in return for the convenience and the superpowers and the entertainment and everything that we get back. We're coming to a kind of terminal station in that journey. We're, we're going to have to ask ourselves really big, really hard questions about who we are and how we want to live as a society and how we want the collective to be sort of administered when it comes to technologies like, you know, like the kind that Clearview is building, really powerful kind of huge facial recognition databases. I mean, and I do take the point, you know, it's right. Yes, completely. The innovation is not technical. You know, this could have been done. Google or Facebook could have done this a decade ago. The innovation is more uh, sort of, yes, yeah, social ethical innovation. You know, they dared to do it. And exactly as Mikhail said, they had nothing to lose. You know, if, if Facebook as was, you know, had tried to do this 10 years ago, there would have been huge blowback. Um, that wasn't an issue for Clearview. But we need to get a handle on Clearview in particular, facial recognition in particular, but use this as a lesson about the broader journey and the trade-offs that are coming. We, we haven't had the big conversation about trade-offs yet properly, and we need to have it really soon. You know, And how can we do that in a way that allows us to retain the incredible benefits that technology is bringing without selling centuries of social development and the evolution of norms and rights and individual liberty without selling all of that down the river? Um, because I think that that is a legacy deeply worth protecting, right? We have to be really careful about that. Yeah, you know, and as we begin to negotiate these uh, trade-offs with ourselves, have this conversation, particularly here in the global north and democratic countries uh, where there is this dialogue, I guess one of the fears that people have around this technology is it becomes established in the system before that conversation can happen. And we all know with technology that it's very difficult to get the toothpaste back into the tube once it gets out. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And that that's 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 fundamental to the challenge is that in this exponential age, you know, the pace of technological change is far outpacing our ability to process it or respond to it and certainly to respond to it collectively. You know, uh, and I think that's a that's a challenge no one has a good answer to yet. I mean, our institutions, I've said this before, I've said it before on Real Vision, uh, our institutions are still grappling with the technologies of Web 2.0, you know, like a a 25-year-old kind of phenomenon. They're, they're, they're grappling with that now as though that is the live issue, that is the big thing they need to get their head around. And it's proving really difficult for them. They're nowhere near really truly getting to grips with this AI moment, technologies like Clearview, technologies like ChatGPT. And what do we do about that? I mean, we have deliberative institutions that can't respond at, at this exponential speed. Um, I favor uh, decentralization and new forms of local control. I think we've centralized too much power um, and that makes us slow and unresponsive and that's really catching up with us now. And what we need is more localism, more more decentralization. That you know, that's far from being the solution to the like a, a one shot solution to this. But I think it's part of the journey we need to go on. Mikhail, let me ask you this: uh, as we talk about this, one of the questions uh, that I asked earlier is this idea of where are we in terms of how pervasive this technology is today uh, in terms of getting the toothpaste app back into the tube? Where are we in your view 
of how pervasive it is, how much it's currently being used. I mean, I think a lot of people uh, watching this probably think, well, listen, Bennington, you decide to live your life in front of a camera. Obviously, there's a huge database of everything that you say and do. Uh, but hey, listen, I don't. Uh, how much do ordinary people get surveilled in this way, whether through their own social media accounts, uh, or as you pointed out, uh, just through the bystander effect of being present in public photo, in public spaces? If you're, um uh, if you're in London, you're basically on TV 24-7. Uh, if you're in New York, you're basically on TV 16-7. Uh, and if you're, you know, in Plainsville, Oklahoma or something like that, you're probably only on TV when you run a red light. So <clears throat> it's very much uh, region dependent, uh, population density dependent, and so on. Um, Clearview claims that uh, they that that they're that, that they've had over a million queries to their database, which sounds like a lot, uh, and queries by law enforcement. But you know that means a thousand law enforcement agencies conducting a thousand uh, you know a thousand searches, right? Um, so my understanding is that uh, a is that in large cities, most, if not all large city, uh, police precincts use some kind of face recognition in some way, shape or form or another. There's actually a really subtle, uh, use of face rec that, uh, is kind of accepted as standard practice, but is still experimental to this day, which is, you know how, like when you, you when you watch law and order and, uh, you have a grainy video footage and somebody says enhance and like suddenly there's a resolution magnification that, uh, that, that like magically pixels uh, turn into sharp edges and stuff, right? So turns out that we actually do have uh, neural upscaling nowadays where you actually can take a VHS recording and upscale it to 4K. <clears throat> and this is used in face recognition in particular where uh, there exist models where you can actually take a blurry photo of a person and infer what the actual face would have been that would have cast that blur. But it's important to remember that it's not precise. There's a, win there's a window slash range of faces that could result in the same blur. So, you know, under the same conditions. It's, pr it's probabilistic. It's probabilistic and, you know, you're only working with whatever your seed data is or like, you know, if, if there are, uh, if there are biases in the, uh, in the training data, then there's going to be biases in the output. Uh, I'm talking primarily about Bayesian priors, um, but the, um, uh, but the, uh, but at the end of the day, what that means is that uh, you can't, r a lot of uh, a lot of times evidence is presented in court that is based on enhanced images that uh, re that require a lot of jury education to uh, to discuss about and and to get them to understand that like this is not what the picture actually looked like this is you know the original picture was very grainy and this is a, a you know a machine's best guess as to what produced that grain but it's but you got to take it with a, no pun intended, grain of salt. David, do you get a sort of feeling in the pit of your stomach when you talk about probabilistic identification for law enforcement purposes? <laughs> I mean, you have to, right? We, we can't, uh, but I, I mean, I guess, you know, we, we make legal decisions on the balance of probability. If, if, you can, if you can educate jury to the point where they can understand that this is a, yeah, a kind of probabilistically reconstituted image um, and not a definitive image of a person. You know, it's it's it, it, it's essentially a statistically created sort of image. Right. Then fine, you know, perhaps that can form part of the tapestry of evidence you're using. Um, but yeah, I mean, we need we need to get a grip on this particular issue. But we need to we need to start a larger conversation or really head into a larger conversation about where all this is heading. And I mean, I mean I'm mean, i reminded too about, I mean, I write about Amazon all the time. Look at this kind of amazing panopticon that Amazon are building. You know, they, they, they have the ring doorbell. How often do you see kind of online ring doorbell footage now, right? They have ring doorbell, which allows them to have kind of constant overview of the front door and the driveway. 
then I think a year or two ago, they sort of introduced that technology where ring doorbells would start to kind of automatically connect to one another and, yes. and allow Amazon to kind of build this model of like the whole road. If there's lots of ring doorbells on it, then they have this little home robot now that they want to like whiz around your living room and your kitchen, which is, of course, seeing everything. You know, and it's, it, you know, pretty soon we'll start to say to Amazon, oh, hey, like the house has run out of like, you know, toothpaste. Why why don't you buy some? It, it's it, they just and and, and soon after that, Amazon will inform you that your house ran out of toothpaste. And right. Sending it to you. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. They, they want to see everything. And of course, why not? And incre and exactly that an incredible kind of convenience will flow from that. But we have to pause and ask ourselves at what cost that convenience, you know, comes at and and what kind of superstructures and technological what forms of technological oversight we're, we're allowing to grow around us and look i'm not sitting here arguing directly against these technologies and their use or even their use in in, in some of the ways we're talking about now i'm just saying we need to have a collective conversation about this we need some collective agency here we need to assert ourselves the human collective against the constant incursions of technologies and 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 big technology companies um that you know that needs to be a conversation not just a one-way street because it, as what's happening is amazing and intellectually and creative creatively just like you two you know i find it so exciting what is happening right now you know like i mean twitter it, x i should call it now is a literal fire hose of ai innovation I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. It's incredible what is happening and it's so exciting. But we do just need a conversation about where it leads us and what we want from it and what we don't. You know, we, we should have the agency. It should serve us. Yeah, but let me ask you this. Will we ever have privacy again? Will we ever have a private conversation? Will we ever have the ability to, you know, to not be filmed, recorded or somehow otherwise observed by, as you put it, the panopticon? There's no there there's no doubt that norms around that have shifted massively and that the idea of, you know, privacy, like you, you, your grandparents' privacy <laughs> is gone. Right. You know, for, for most people, certainly people who who live, you know, in, in, in cities and live with technology and don't have a particularly mindful relationship with technology, which is most people and most of the time, including right. me. No, like, you know, there's always something listening or something that could be listening or might be listening tomorrow and processing that data. I mean, you know, look at look at the data we're giving to to, you know, chat GPT, you know, look at I mean, we were chatting before the show. Look at these incredible AI virtual companions based on celebrities that Meta wants to build now. So like Paris Hilton's going to talk to you about, I don't know, like detective work or whatever it was. And Ew. Snoop Dogg's going to be your dungeon master and all this stuff. Right. They want people to have deep, close, intimate, interesting conversations with these AI companions. That that's data. That's all data that we are handing to these huge technology companies. So okay, those. Tell me but Tell me more about the strict old dog of privacy, I think, are gone. Mikhail, let me ask you this. One of the things that's interesting to me, and, and maybe we're all on this show dating ourselves here a little bit, is the intergenerational aspect of this, how younger people seem to be just much more comfortable with the idea of sharing their data. It's almost like this sense that they don't care and they don't feel like they have anything to hide. Whereas if you, you talk to people in their, in their 60s or 70s, they kind of say, are you guys all insane? Why would you do that? Well... So, first of all, uh, when you're younger, you uh, want you you still see yourself as the center of the world. And uh, more importantly, those of us who've been around the block a few times have seen things that were totally normal twenty years ago be, uh, you know, just heinous crimes uh, in like declared retroactively twenty years later. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, I think that a lot of us who are a little bit more hesitant to put anything out into the public sphere intentionally, uh, you know, kind of have this hesitation of like, yeah, you say that now, watch, uh, right. you know, wa wa watch the, um, you know, what is it? Uh, the, the children's revolution uh, come for you in another 15 years uh, for something yeah. that you thought was innocuous. Mikhail, the, the, the joke you told in 10th grade would definitely get you canceled today. Oh, don't even get me started. Um, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just thrilled that there is no video footage of me, like in high school and college, behaving like a maniac. Yeah, no, um, no one you know, wants no one wants footage of themselves in high school on the internet. But uh, yeah, I mean, young young high schoolers now have that. So uh, I, I think that 
I think that a, a really meaningful conversation may kick off when there is some kind of privacy. It may only kick off when there's some kind of privacy Armageddon moment, when when there's some kind of huge data release. Um, and not only is there a huge release of data, and we've seen that before, but it is kind of essentially searchable by name. You know, I mean, I will start to tell my children soon, assume that everything you put into the internet, everything you type in or say in or anything you put in will one day be totally public and not only that but searchable by name so the people who know you will be able to type in your name and find the whole lot because one day something like that may happen you see these huge hacks and these huge data releases but you just get this massive tranche of data that's just like blamange and no one really like can find anything in it someone will do an amazing job one day assisted by ai of just putting a ton of private stuff out into the public domain and making it tr truly searchable. And when that happens, perhaps we will have a reinvigorated conversation about privacy and online privacy and kind of the road we're going down. David, here's a, here's a, here's a counter argument. Uh, what if we wind up in a world uh, where the exact opposite happens, where there's so much data out there that nobody cares? I'm, I'm just sort of doing this as a sort of theoretical because we, we bring our own sort of perceptions of the world and biases to it. And to you, to me, to Mikhail, that sounds horrifying, right? That's everybody's worst nightmare. That the thing that you searched uh, in, uh, in 2003 is going to be searchable by name and everybody in the world is going to know it. But what happens if we, we end up, this is a theoretical question, in a world where so much data is so pervasive that you know, everyone else's quirks are just as bizarre or more bizarre than your own. I mean, it, it's, it, it, I know it's a hypothetical question and I know it's a weird sort of philosophical angle to take, but you almost wonder if you, you wind up with a society that has a, just a very different relationship to the idea of what is and isn't private, if that is even a concept that still exists. I mean, it's terrifying to me, but maybe to someone who's, you know, 19 years old, it's liberating. I find that hard to believe, but but maybe it is. We've uh, I've seen futurists say that uh, by 2052, everybody will have seen everybody naked. Um, and frankly, uh, if everybody's going to see me naked, that should be something horrifying for everybody else. Uh, right. But the, uh, right. But that's but that's the point, right? Is that like it's like well, you know, we all look fat and terrible, and from from this and that angle. And so, does it just become this world? I mean, it is like almost a science fiction kind of uh, dorm room debate. But it is this bizarre question about do do the, the the preconceptions that we have about the world necessarily hold for the future? I, hard to even I think it I think I think the the journey you're talking about happens, and I think it's it it, it has in significant measure already happened and and that's part of what kind of you, you know the older generation and your grandparents and your parents seem find very hard to understand. I mean, once upon a time, the idea that kind of like your private family photos, or photos of you drunk at that party or that kind of like, you know, that birthday party uh, for your friend or whatever, that those kinds of pictures your boss might see or your colleagues might see would have been seen as like borderline scandalous and just deeply embarrassing right. and, and unprofessional and all, all of those things. Now that's just, that's just right. life, you know, no, no, that, 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 that form of norms have changed. You know, the, right. the idea that it would be deeply humiliating. I mean, you know, like li literally in the 90s, if you wanted your colleagues to see you on the beach in a state of undress, <laughs> like you, you had to like take those photos, print them out, bring them into the office and like force people to look at them. Now, <laughs> like everyone actively yeah. posts them online and all, everyone they know and all their colleagues and their boss and all of that see those pictures right. and there's, there's no problem with that everyone does it that n the norms right. have totally shifted so perhaps we can get to the world you're talking about where everyone's sort of um foibles and quirks and idiosyncrasies are public uh, but so are everyone else's so it's fine and we really have that kind of truly tolerant accepting nirvana you know i'd love to think that that's where we go um i just wouldn't bet the uh, bet the house on it just yet i think okay. this also wrapped back to questions about uh, the use of face recognition technology in uh, in police proceedings. In particular, it wraps back to, uh, to uh, jury education and the familiarity of your, you know, a jury of your peers with the technology that you're using for conducting your case or stating your claim. Uh, 
basically we all like if it's true that we all eventually get a little bit more cynical about uh like yeah yeah so what your nudes are on the net everybody's nudes are on the net who cares uh that implies a certain savviness of the underlying technology which also dovetails with a savviness of understanding that like yeah yeah, yeah this face recognition software put you uh, at the scene of this crime or whatever like that doesn't necessarily mean anything i think that it's actually a good thing because it means that the that as time goes on, uh, subsequent generations will be better about having a good intuitive grasp of like, no, this isn't going to, uh, you know, th this isn't going to implicate someone. Um, and anybody who does trust the software is kind of dismissed as the same kind of boomer who nowadays uh, falls for a Nigerian email scam, you know? Um, the growing pains, however, are going to be difficult. The transition from now to then is, uh, is going to be rough, specifically because right now uh, we have this unjustified trust in technology. And in fact, uh, with, uh, with Clearview in particular, uh, there have been a lot of cases where judges have been more eager than they should have to take cases based on the output of these extremely expensive face recognition systems for the simple fact that if they don't take the case, then they essentially are saying to the police department, you blew like a giant chunk of your budget on something that ultimately doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, I for one, my head is just reeling when we talk about this. Obviously, pretty clear from this conversation that we have enormous changes that are on the cusp of happening right now. The technology is out there. It's a question of scale. As you pointed out, David, a question of the kinds of decisions that particularly here in the global north that societies and democracies want to negotiate with themselves. Just an incredible conversation, guys. I've just been blown away by this. A really incredible. Let's do final thoughts, key takeaways from each of you. Uh, we started with you, Mikhail. David, over to you. Final thoughts, key takeaways from this incredibly terrifying and engaging conversation. I think, you know, my fundamental position, as always, is we just we need to see this technological change through the lens of fundamental human needs and values. We need to think about how these technologies are impacting human beings and fundamental human values like convenience and privacy and, and sort of the quest for meaning and productivity and, and all of that. When we think about technology in that structured way, it empowers us to sort of make sense of what's happening, think about what it really means for the future and what it means for our own lives and then respond. And we're in urgent need of that now. Like if you look to that conversation, because this is only going to intensify. If you look to the conversation I had on, on Real Vision with Robert Scoble um, a week or two ago, I think it was, you know, he's talking about, you know, we all know it's coming, like hundreds of millions of autonomous vehicles, humanoid robots. And then you get a kind of everything as a service economy where the autonomous vehicles deliver, you know, on demand tap, autonomous vehicle comes to your house with a humanoid robot in it that comes into your house and does your laundry and unloads your dishwasher and all of that stuff. All of that is data too. You know, the robot is going to be seeing you. It's going to be taking pictures of your house and your face and all of the rest of it. It's just data, 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 a fire hose, literal fire hose of data. So this is only going to intensify and we need some form of collective conversation about it now. And I think that needs to start from the ground up. Our institutions can't respond quickly enough. We need new citizen collectives to address this. David, extremely well said. Mikhail, over to you. Final thoughts, key takeaways. Um, I agree with all of David's points, uh, but I don't necessarily believe that the answers, David, that you're suggesting will necessarily be viable. Um, a, converse, a national conversation or a social conversation uh, doesn't sound to me like it, it doesn't sound like a concrete action. Um, it's a uh, we definitely need social migration to a new paradigm, but uh, that's uh, but what are but what does that actually mean on the ground? You know, you talked about democratization, and I do want to mention that, like, I don't think democratization or uh, decentralization is necessarily the answer. Look, you, you mentioned that uh, Clearview is taking data from the public, from the commons, and then packaging it and selling it back to. Uh, back to the police force, and that's a problem. And I agree that that's a problem. But look, if they were taking that data and then giving it to the police force as a donation, that wouldn't make any of this better. 
um, <laughs> if, uh, you know, you talked about, uh, de uh, about like institutions coming up with their own AIs. Well, as a matter of fact, there's a, there's a company that I wanted to mention, uh, it's a, a little, uh, there's a, there's a French AI startup called Mistral that uh, just, to come, just the other week released an open source LLM that uh, is, that they're heralding as being unfiltered slash uncensored. Like they don't apply a lot of the safety features that GPT and others have, uh, and Llama, for example, have applied to their models. And you know what? Like people don't really like it. I mean, uh, People are using it, but it's led to a lot of controversy, and there's a lot of folks that are really, really upset about this move. And as far as decentralization, you talk uh, you talk about how robots are going to come into your house and to, you know and, and take pictures, and that's data that gets uploaded to Amazon, for example. You talk about like these Amazon Ring devices that are uploading data to Amazon, and you're absolutely right; that's a problem. But you know what? If it was decentralized. That means they wouldn't be uploading it to Amazon. They would be uploading it to literally everybody, um, which means that they can be mined by, uh, you know, burglars, for example, or stalkers. Um, you know, Mikhail, it's, let's, it, give, it, let's give David a chance to respond to the point. Please, that you please. Made. Yeah, I mean, look, absolutely fascinating. And there's much in there I agree with. I mean, this it gets it gets political and philosophical really super quickly. We need another hour to thrash all that out. I mean, if we if we if we hand some of these functions and some of these technological powers like to the people to the collective you know like yeah there, i mean it that's easy to say you know just as mikhail says like what does that really look like and and how does that really work and obviously if the if if the collective just operates then as a new as a new kind of amazon for example then we we haven't advanced very far you know if we just exactly as he says you know if, if um clearview just if we if we build a new open source Clearview and it just gives the data to the police force, uh, you know, in what way have we advanced? We we if we're going to that, what I'm suggesting needs to be coupled with a new set of norms around how we do all of this. That is easy to speak, um, easy to say, but very very difficult to construct, and certainly hugely difficult to construct quickly enough to be meaningful when it comes to this technology. So, you know, this is just a journey we're all on. We're all trying to make sense of this, put the put the pieces of the puzzle together. And this is just one tiny, tiny corner of the broader puzzle that is the exponential age. And we, we just have to keep trying to make sense of it and keep trying to process it at the speed it's, it's coming towards us at. Um, we've, human beings have lived through other periods of rapid, hugely destabilizing change. We will get through this, but, you know, exactly as Mikhail says, the transition period is going to be deeply unsettling and, and difficult. It's going to be hugely exciting to watch. But yeah, all the pieces of the puzzle are up in the air right now. Well, you know, guys, I'm just going to come right out and say, it. this has been a truly extraordinary conversation. I think, you know, for me, uh, these topics, uh, thinking about what the future is going to look like, the technology, the risks, the opportunities, the social, political, philosophical questions, just extraordinary, guys. Thank you both so much for joining us. There's only one way that we're going to you know, be able to do this more, and that's to just do another conversation uh, with the three of us. Just really, really incredible. Obviously, we've just run out of time here, but we certainly haven't run out of things to talk about. I hope we'll be able to do this again soon, guys. Absolutely. I'd love to be back soon. And thank you so much. It's always super fun to talk. You, you know you're going to see me again, Ash. <laughs> Guys, thanks so much for joining us. And everyone, thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.